Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and this is Cindy Oliver and she's in training to be a scientist, although at the moment, as you can see, she's sleeping on the job. But I can't really blame her because the weather today in Sydney is absolutely awful. It's just so hot and steamy in the sort of the outer suburbs of Sydney. It's going to be about 40 degrees today. And I mean 40 degrees centigrade, not 40 degrees Fahrenheit. I wish it was going to be 40 degrees Fahrenheit, but alas, no. Anyway, I was planning to do a video this week about all the nonsense that has been going on with the lab leak claims. But I'm nowhere near ready, especially because there's, you know, the new data that's now come out regarding the seafoods market samples. Anyway, as luck would have it, a lovely person in the comments section on my last video pointed me to another topic that requires much less preparation. Let's have a read. Would you care to react on Dr. Campbell's recent interview with Professor Clancy on long COVID, particularly minute 44, where they talk about dot, 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 well, I guess about you, though I am not sure as they are so courteous as not to mention your name. Well, since as she asked so nicely, let's have a look. To taking, those, to taking those German studies, uh, th th there's been spike protein discovered in the myocardium of patients that died from spontaneous cardiac events, sadly. Uh, there's been spike protein discovered mm. in uh, post-mortem brain uh, samples as well. What people have said to me is mm. the fact that you've discovered spike protein on its own without nucleocapsid protein or any other viral proteins doesn't necessarily mean that that spike protein got there as a result of the vaccine but i i think it does i think it does i mean is there any plausible mechanism yeah. where whereby a virus could infect say the myocardium or the brain and all of that virus could be successfully eliminated. 100% of that virus could be eliminated, apart from one particular protein expression of that virus. That doesn't sound viable to me. I, that, I'm does that totally sound on your side. To you? yeah. No, it, it makes no sense to me that if, and this is what has been shown, is that they they use uh, specific antibodies against uh, uh, nuclear um, capsid antigens and others against spike and they're only finding the spike positive. I mean, the whole purpose of this is to show that you're only getting expression of one part of the, the virus. And it makes no logical sense to me that you would suddenly not get a response to the 95 or 90 percent of the uh, uh, of the virus that's infecting if that's in fact causing the spike protein to be expressed. It doesn't make sense. No, I agree. So isol yeah. isolated spike protein is an indication of vaccine in the absence of infection in a particular tissue. That's I'm happy that, to run with that, that hypothesis. That's, the, that's what most people, most people believe, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, the commenter was wanting me to react to this. So here is my reaction. Huh? Of course, if you are looking for a slightly more detailed reaction, stick around. But I would like to point out that I don't think Dr. Campbell was actually referring to me. And even if he was, the reason for not mentioning my name would have nothing to do with courtesy. It would be to not provide his viewers with the name of someone who debunks him. John doesn't like people providing evidence that he is wrong. Now, when John tells Professor Clancy that people have told him this. He neglects to mention that they didn't just tell him, they also provided him with a link to a paper that provides incontrovertible proof that this is in fact the case. Here is an example. Eric Burnett, MD, wrote the following in reply to a tweet John made about this on one of his videos. John, I'm curious if you've read this study. They rarely found nucleocapsid protein in the tissue of people with COVID-induced vascular injury. And he provides a screenshot of the relevant section of the study, which says 
SARS-CoV-2 RNA and nuclear capsid protein were rarely detected in situ in any COVID-19 heart. However, in each case, abundant SARS-CoV-2 spike protein was evident. And Dr. Burnett also provides a link to the study so that John can confirm that this is indeed the case. Now, you may have noticed that John has a poster behind him saying, follow the evidence. And he often makes reference to this in his videos, claiming that this is what he does. So why in this case has he deliberately ignored the evidence and instead phoned a friend, so to speak? If you have an answer to this, please let me know in the comments. And if you don't have an answer, maybe you could phone a friend and they'll have an answer for you. In the meantime, let's have a look at the paper that Dr. Campbell chose to ignore. This is a study here, and they compared cardiac tissue from people who had died of COVID with heart tissue from people who died before the pandemic. And what they found was this. Although nuclear capsid protein was found in all lung samples, it was only found in two of 11 cardiac samples. And these two samples were also positive for viral RNA. In contrast, viral spike protein was found in all cardiac samples. So this is not someone telling Dr. Campbell what they think. This is hard evidence pointing out that spike protein without nuclear capsid happens in cases of SARS-CoV-2 infection. But what about what Professor Clancy said about it not making sense that you would find spike protein and not nuclear capsid protein if someone was infected? That sounded pretty convincing. And after all, he is supposed to be an immunology professor. Well, there's a bit more to the story than that. This is what his former university has said about him after he began promoting ivermectin as a treatment for COVID. At the time he was doing this, there was no evidence that ivermectin worked. And of course, there is now definitive evidence that it doesn't work. Robert Clancy is not speaking on behalf of the University of Newcastle when offering his opinion on this issue. The university has not funded his research since 2009 and he retired in 2013. The university does not consider Robert Clancy a subject matter expert on COVID-19. If Professor Clancy was a subject matter expert on COVID-19, he would have been familiar with the paper that we have been discussing. And he would know that the likely source of the spike protein in the heart is not direct infection of the heart by the virus in most cases. The spike protein most likely originates in the lungs and is carried to the heart by macrophages. And macrophages are a type of white blood cell that have a number of functions, including gobbling up microorganisms and cellular debris. And the paper that Dr. Campbell chose to deliberately ignore is just one paper showing that spike protein is present without nuclear capsid in the organs of infected people. John also mentioned brains in his discussion with Professor Clancy. There are also studies showing that spike protein is present without nuclear capsid protein in the brains of infected people. For example, in this study, samples of brain tissue from 40 patients who had died from COVID were tested for both spike and nuclear capsid proteins. And this paper was published in October 2020. So none of the patients were vaccinated before they died. And this is what they found. In the 40% of cases positive for SARS-CoV-2 proteins on immunohistochemistry, spike protein was detected in 88% of cases, whereas nuclear capsid protein was only detected in 44% of cases. And here's another study. In this study, they were looking at the amplification of central nervous system damage in Alzheimer's disease from SARS-CoV-2 infection. And they were comparing the brains of people with and without dementia who had died from severe COVID with the brains from people who had died 
before the pandemic. Nuclear capsid protein was only found in the brains of two of the 13 COVID cases, and these brains also had viral RNA. But spike protein was found in abundance in the brains of all the COVID cases. The other interesting thing that they did in this study is they incubated human brain endothelial cells with low levels and high levels of S1 spike protein. The low levels were equivalent to the circulating levels of spike protein in people who had been vaccinated, and the high levels were equivalent to the levels of spike protein in people with severe COVID. They measured a number of cell parameters and the results are shown in this table. There were no significant changes in any of the parameters between the control cells and the cells incubated with low doses of S1 spike protein. In contrast, high doses of spike protein resulted in significant changes in the cells. And in this table, the p-value in the significant change column shows the significance of the change versus the control and low-dose spike. And as you can see, there is a significant change for most of the parameters. So spike protein at the level seen in severe COVID causes damage to brain cells, but spike protein at the level following vaccination does not. So in summary, Dr. John Campbell deliberately chose to ignore the evidence that was provided to him. And instead, he chose to phone a friend so that he could present the opinion of someone who wasn't familiar with the evidence. Also, he could continue his lucrative narrative of scaremongering about vaccines while downplaying COVID harms. And just to reiterate something that I've said before, People like John, who deliberately scaremonger about vaccines, make it harder for people who have suffered genuine vaccine harm to be taken seriously. If you'd like to look further into the data I've presented, as opposed to relying on opinions, I provide a link to it in the video's description. And please remember this video is about the science but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. If you've got this far, although it wasn't that far this time because it's a fairly short video, but anyway, even so, thank you for listening. And if you've liked or commented on the video, double thank you because you helped the algorithm and that means that more people will see the video. And as I've pointed out before, even if you leave a nasty, insulting comment, the algorithm doesn't know that. They just say, Wow, interaction on this video. Let's show it to more people. Woo! Anyway, where was I? I've got no idea where I was. Okay, anyway, what was I? Th what do we have to say next, Cindy? I know. Thank you to everyone who has bought me a coffee and beautiful Cindy a treat. We really appreciate your support. I will be continuing to make videos about the science in the future. So if you'd like to see them, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.